welcome back to another Conquest Overland video. I'm Simon Conquest and today we're looking at replacing the wastegate modulator on our 2001 year TD5 Land Rover Discovery. Now the TD5 Discovery is fitted with a Garrett GT2052S turbocharger and the performance of this is controlled by a wastegate actuator which is this vacuum tub on the top. This actuator is in turn acted upon by the wastegate modulator which you can barely see in the dock but it's just down here where I'm pointing. We'll get a better view of that shortly. The wastegate modulator which is down there acts upon the wastegate actuator up here in certain circumstances and basically smooths out the operation of the actuator but most importantly it prevents harmful overboosting. I'll go into more detail of that later on. The replacement part that I've gone for is made by the original equipment manufacturer, so it's an OEM part, uh, which happens to be Pierberg, which I believe is a German company. Now if you look at the modulator here, you'll see we've got an electrical connector that links directly to the ECU and then you've got one, two, three air pipes. The pipe on the left here takes an air feed directly from the turbo and then inside there's a solenoid valve. You can see the barrel shape for the solenoid there. And that solenoid valve dictates where the air is fed during operation. When it's inactive via low engine revs, all of the air goes out of this pipe here at the bottom, going towards the bottom of the screen. Uh, that comes out to the actuator and the turbo is allowed to boost as much as it wants. But because you're at low revs, there's no real risk of overboosting. When you come to higher revs, there is an increased risk of overboosting, which is where the modulator comes in. So above 1,900 RPM, the modulator becomes active and remains active until the revs drop down to below 1750 RPM. To smooth out the airflow to the actuator, the modulator opens allowing some of the air to be diverted into the pipe on the right here and away from the actuator. Now this valve can operate up to 16 times a second which is rather fast and it's completely mechanical so it's no surprise that after several years of service the valves develop mechanical faults. They can develop electrical faults with the solenoid but the most common faults are mechanical with either the components inside or the valve specifically inside jamming or losing what the manufacturer refers to as tightness which basically means they're leaking air or too tight and not leaking air when they should be. Failure of this modulator can lead to the actuator being allowed to give damaging full turbo boost or overboost. Now your ECU is the second line of defence for overboosting and it will quickly detect that an overboost is happening and it protects the engine from damage by cutting the fuel. So the symptoms of a failing modulator can be a general loss of power but at more extreme circumstances usually when the revs are over about 2500 the engine fuel supply gets cut by the ECU and you end up with extremely noticeable stuttering. Typically this will happen when, happen when you're on full power going up a hill or crossing a sand dune or something. If you're an overlander you can find yourself in some very remote places and in situations where obtaining parts is difficult. You've got a couple of options. One would be to drive at low revs to stop overboost, but that's not always possible. Uh, say for instance you're in the middle of a desert and you've still got a number of sand dunes to cross to reach civilization. You're not going to be able to do that without giving uh, the engine some revs. So in a real emergency it is possible to completely bypass the modulator, this thing here. I don't advise doing that because you risk severe engine damage so I wouldn't do that. This modulator is an extremely important engine protection feature and really does need to be there. Better is to carry a spare modulator. Now you notice 
that I've got two here. Fortunately they're quite light and small and relatively cheap especially when compared to the cost of a replacement engine so I would always advise any overlander to have one of these in your onboard spares box. What I'm doing here is I've just bought a new one which is this one here this is going into my overland spares box and the old one is going on the vehicle. I put the oldest one on to rotate my parts. Top tip with your spare parts it's always a good idea to have a printout of the fitting instructions. It's just one little bit of paper just makes life a lot easier so you don't have to go diving through for the uh, manual. Right this this is a test of the wastegate modulator which controls the wastegate actuator. Just now I've gone over 2000 revs and I'm going to deliberately hold it in a lower gear while we go up into the revs. Two and a half thousand revs and I don't know what the figure's doing. Is it doing anything Jack? It was, it's going 34, 39, 40, it's staying at 40, it's gone back to zero. It does keep on cutting out to zero, which is the fault, yeah. because it shouldn't be cutting back to zero. Oh. That means the engine's sensing an overboost, and the uh, computer shuts off the fuel, or reduces the fuel, to stop the engine getting damaged from too much turbo pressure. Yeah. turbo over boost. If we were really making the engine work like we were going up a hill and doing particularly high revs we'd actually be stuttering. To start with we're going to be taking away this turbo hose here so we've got better access to the modulator. I've always found it better to remove Jubilee clips using a hex socket rather than a screwdriver. There we go. I'll give that a little bit of a clean before we put it back. That's the hose. So here it is, the wastegate modulator. I've got some damaged wiring loom here, so while I'm in this part of the engine, never miss an opportunity to do some uh, preventative maintenance. I'm going to be redoing this protection for the wires, keep them in good condition. One of the things I do like to do when I'm in the area of the turbo is just check the actual spindles itself, just make sure there's no undue wobbling there, these are nice and firm. I'm giving it a little spin with my finger just gently. They're not the blades aren't catching on the body anywhere, so that's good. The turbo's in good condition. Just gonna give it a little clean. You do tend to get all deposits coming in here from the crank house breather pipe. So don't panic too much unless it's absolutely swimming in oil. Frequent viewers of this channel will know that I'm quite into preventative maintenance. So, having exposed this lot and found that the cable protection is or was damaged and falling apart, I'm replacing it. Electrical faults can be horrible to deal with, so it's always better to stop them developing in the first place. These two ends are done so that this end doesn't cause any chafing to the wires, which can sometimes happen.
and I am of course using tape specially designed for harnessing work. Next I'm removing the electrical connector. In theory that clip presses in and then the whole connector pulls off at the bottom and it's come away quite nicely. Just put that wire out of the way. With the electrical connection taken off you can actually move all the wires out of the way now to give you even better access to the modulator. I'm going to leave this one attached to it at the moment, take that off when it's uh, out of the vehicle. I'm going to disconnect it from here. These haven't been off for quite a while, in fact these are still the original so I doubt they've ever been off in the life of the vehicle. So no surprise that they're a little bit sticky. That's it, but they're off. Next are these two bolts here, which are 8mm size bolts. Careful to catch the bolts. I have to crawl under the car to retrieve them. That's one. That's two. So here we are. That's the old modulator. Just going to take the pipes off, clean everything up and fix these two pipes to the new one and uh, replace it. Working out of the vehicle, the old pipes came off very easily and they're now put back on in place. I'm just going to quickly fix these back in. There are no washers here, they just bolt straight onto the side. Started, get that one in. Apologies for getting my hand in the way. Right, they're just done up finger tight for the moment. Need to get the little torque wrench out and do them up to 10 newton meters. So here we go, torque wrench set at 10 newton meters. Which isn't that much. Not much at all really. So done. And reconnect the pipes. Two. Just going to have a look at the electrical connector before I put that on, make sure it's clean when it needs to be clean. Yep. That's on. remains now is for me to put the turbo pipe back on but I'm going to give that a little bit of a clean before I do so.
don't want to make these silly tight because the metal clips can actually cut into the hose if you're doing too tight. That's it, it's finished. Let's take it for a test drive.